Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Ido. I'm with uh, LakeFS. Uh, we create an open source solution, which is uh, Git for Data. And Git is used for lots of things. A lot of, some of them is to test uh, your code, or in our case, test your data. And we'll talk today about how to use LakeFS and other open source environments to supercharge your data testing. Um, and the reason that we exist is that we believe that there's a lot of challenges that were already solved in the world of code, but exist very much in the world of data. And our story begins when someone needs to develop a new ETL, for example. Uh, anybody here develops ETLs sometimes? Okay, great. Uh, so the, it starts with getting the code, right? You need the code. If you modify an ETL, you're gonna go to a Git repository, you're gonna check out your environment. Um, but then when it comes to getting a data environment to test against, then there is a dance, right? Everybody does something different. You might be sampling data. You might be copying data. You might be separating readers and writers and reading from one bucket and writing to another. See a lot of like people, yeah, that's fun. Uh, um, there's like this best effort to try and get something that kind of looks like production so we can test our ETLs against it. And then I finished uh, that. And then the next thing that I do is I promote my ETL. What do we promote? We promote the code of the ETL, right? So I wrote an ETL, let's say a retention ETL that deletes files, right? I tested it against something that kind of looks like prod, but it's not. And then when I run it again in prod, the first time that it actually runs in prod is in prod, right? So we hope that everything is gonna be okay. Uh, and then even if, and I know that the, everybody here does not write bugs besides me, I write bugs, but even if we didn't, it's enough that somebody changed you know, the schema or AWS had an outage, God forbid, or something happened. And when the data breaks in production, it's a manual heavy lifting, labor intensive, time consuming headache to try and roll back the data to a good state. Um, I just, I have a flight uh, tomorrow, I don't know if you guys had, and it's just a, a gentle reminder to what happened in the States. Someone unintentionally deleted some files last time. 11,000 flights got canceled. I hope that in the future, you'll be able to roll back on deletion of files. Uh, so this won't happen. So uh, it actually gets worse, right? And it gets worse for everybody around here and assume that's kind of utilizing solutions like uh, Airflow uh, because we can do a lot more. That's a, that's a good thing, right? Like there was this idea of an ETL that was supposed to be very basic. And then it became a, li a little bit more complicated. And then it became a little bit a lot more complicated. And today, uh, I think this is actually a, a, a screenshot of a very small ETL <laughs> from, from what a lot of you guys are managing. There's just like hundreds and hundreds of things that can go wrong. Every step can fail. And then our challenge begins when this step fails. Like this one over here, right? Step 72 out of 150, right? And then I want to try and troubleshoot what, that ha what happened. So I look at the logs and I'm trying to identify the issue and I review the data at the beginning of the DAG and I'm kind of going slow. There's a lot of alt tab here, right? I'm going <laughs> slowly trying to figure out, okay, what happened to this table and then what happened to that file and then what changed over here? And then I fix this and then I rerun it from the beginning hoping that everything is going to be okay. This is how we operate. There is no other way to operate. So this is how we operate. And this is kind of, um, this is recorded? N not great. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, it takes time. It's, it's, it's annoying. It's not, it's not fun. So we said, uh, having given, uh, can I get a mic? We said having, having given you guys a, a big, big um, uh, hint, we said, let's try and manage data like code, right? So we have the object store, and this can be S3, Azure Blob, Google Storage, MinIO, Delhi CS, Net, anything that exposes an S3 interface. And we built something on top of it that you can spin up in minutes that gives, gives a Git interface to this object store. So imagine that you can take a bucket or a collection of buckets, and you can branch them. You can make changes and commit those changes. You can merge these changes back. You can roll back in case of errors, right? Anything that you will do with code, 
you can now do with this data. And then the ecosystem of tools that you have in your environment can access the data via LakeFS, via LakeFS API, and get those versioning capabilities. So if before I was accessing a collection and a bucket, now it will include a name of a branch or a commit identifier, a, a, a branch's main prod dev experiment. A commit identifier is production yesterday at 5 p.m. before an ETL ran, or Remember that specific task in the DAG? The commit associated with that step 52 out of 132. Let's look at the commit over there. What the data set looked like over there at that specific point, right? And now uh, the Git actions themselves, we can run those from a web interface, from a command line interface. This is the LexCTL command line or directly from Python code if you wanted to. Now, how does this work? Uh, I started by saying that this is for data lakes. We work on top of object store, and after you understand how it works, you'll understand why we always work on top of object store. We take advantage of the fact that the object store is immutable. So you have like a bunch of files here, and this can be parquet files, it can be videos, it can be images, it can be anything you want. Every commit in LakeFS is basically a collection of pointers to objects that sit on top of your managed bucket. So your data stays in place. Okay, and this is, but in, in case I, sorry that in case, trying not to sound like a book on the record, everything that I'm speaking about is open source, right? Uh, so now, let's say someone deletes this file and writes a new file, because again, the, the object store is immutable. We do copy and write, and the next commit will point to this additional file. But files that did not change, like these three files over here, you will have multiple commits pointing to the same physical objects. What, the reason this is so important is if I want to create a branch, like I want to create an isolated testing environment, that's a metadata only operation. That's a zero copy clone. That can happen in milliseconds and hundreds of petabytes of lakes. Right? It also means that I'm not actually taking any additional storage for it. So every data engineer in my environment can have a complete production environment without ever uh, creating a single kilobyte. Also, when I go back in time, by nature, a lot of time in data lakes, a lot of the files are static, and then a much smaller subset of the files are being added or removed on a regular basis, so I can go back in time without taking snapshots of the same files over and over again, because I de facto deduplicate the lake over time. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a quick demo about this with like a Databricks environment with Spark, and then I'm going to show a quick demo with this and Airflow with the integration. Okay. Okay, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, okay. Demo time, this is where everything breaks. Okay, so this is LakeFS. Kind of looks and feels like, uh, like Git for a reason. I have here a bunch of repositories. A repository is a logical term, so it can be all or parts of your data sets. So here I have a repository called Learn LakeFS. And what I did here is I actually went ahead and I imported uh, some data from a bucket into this repository. Importing means just creating those pointers, not actually copying anything, right? But now I have here under my main branch, which is uh, my only branch, I have here a path uh, called product reviews that has some parquet files that happen to be Amazon reviews. And if I want to start and query this data, then I'll basically create a data frame and I'll... Oh, I did the wrong thing. I created a branch, but I'll go to the, to the top one. I create... I, uh, I, create a data frame and I read the data from my main branch, my product reviews, and here are my different product reviews, right? So here's a five-star review, a five-star watch review. It's probably a really good watch. Um, and now let's say that for any reason whatsoever, I want to create a testing environment. So I want to test a DAG against this data set. This DAG is going to change things. I don't want to do anything to my production environment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a branch. Actually, I don't know if you noticed, but I mistakenly created the branch already, so I'll delete it just to show you what it looks like again. I can create a branch by clicking here, and I can branch out of any other branch or any other historical commit in any other branch. So start getting your mind kind of going crazy about reprocess, backfilling, uh, reproducing, troubleshooting, late arriving data, like all these things that are maybe very useful to go to a point in time in the history. Or I can do this uh, from a uh, Python, Right? In this case, I'm going to use my Python client. I'm going to create a branch. 
in my experiment branch and I'm in my main, out of my main branch and I'm gonna call it experiment. Again, millisecond operation, nothing was copied. I can now query my experiment branch instead of my main branch and I will get the same exact data set. So now I'll have two branches here, my experiment and the main branch that are exactly the same. They're pointing to the same reference commit. I didn't copy anything. But even though I didn't copy anything, I did achieve full isolation. Right? So now when I run my code against my, uh, my, my batch, let's say for example my code filters out all the one star reviews, filter out all the five star reviews, and then repartition the data by the number of ratings, and I'm doing this in my uh, experiment branch and my experiment branch only. This means that whoever goes and looks at main, nothing changed, right? I have my product reviews here in main, but in my experiment branch, I created these new product reviews by ratings. This exists only here, only on my branch. Nobody else sees it. I can test my data. I can play with the data. I can see that it makes sense that, I don't know, that my schema didn't change, whatever it is that you want to do in isolation, right? See that the data, it looks the way that it's supposed to look. These are all uncommitted changes, just like Git, right? I can see all my uncommitted changes across the different tables, the different data sets, and I can, if I want to, commit those changes, right? So I can commit, and at the point of, and at the, point of the commit, I can also add, and this is super powerful, metadata describing the commit. This will be very relevant in the Airflow example in a second, because, for example, one of the things that I can do here is a code version. Or well, another thing that I can add here is the DAG execution ID. Like, who actually called this? And we'll see that in a second. But in this case, right now, um, without Airflow, my life is not as good as it can be. So I'm just gonna commit this data set manually. And then, of course, I get here lineage, which is super cool, because someone can go to this data set here in the experiment branch and uh, say, wait, where did this come from? I don't understand. And you have the blame functionality of a git. So you can say, oh, this commit ID actually did it. So this person, that's me, I'm uh, B3E, a few seconds ago, changed this file together with all the rest of these files that were also added to my lake. And by the way, this is the code that it used in order to change that file, which is obviously the code that you and I just uh, went through. Right, and the, and the last thing is, even though I'm in a testing environment, if everything, kind of just a hint to the future, if this is also a deployment use case, then I can also compare the two commits that are at this point different, and I can choose to merge the changes from my experiment branch to my production branch and atomically promote all my changes in a single plan. So this can be like a multi-table transaction that changed a lot of things in isolation. I finished it and I go back in. Again, keep that in mind as we're going to speak about Airflow in a second. So this is the generic demo. Now let's talk about how much this is better with Airflow. So uh, LakeFS integrates with Airflow in, in a couple of ways. We have, Lake, Lake, we have operators, so you can, straight, you can uh, very easily create branches, upload objects, get objects, get commits, merge, and so on directly from, from Airflow. We have sensors, so you can sense for a commit, you can sense for a file upload and actually execute a DAG accordingly. And we have LakeFS hooks, that's our version of actions, of Git actions. So for example, you can say, before I merge something, right, as I change something in a, in a branch, I'm gonna merge it, I wanna automatically execute a, uh, a, uh, um, a DAG at that point in time. How much time do I have? How do I look? I'm good, okay. So, the, and the beautiful thing here is that it's really easy to start. So we're gonna go through two examples. The first example is I have there's a, these are really not aligned correctly. The first example is I have a DAG already. I'm an active user of Airflow. I have DAGs, but I want to run them in isolation, right? My DAGs can fail midway, and if they do, I don't want to expose any bad data to production, right? So all I'm going to do is I'm going to, at the beginning of the, of the DAG, create a branch, execute that DAG, and at the end, I'm gonna merge it back into prod. By doing this very, very simple thing that literally takes 10 minutes, what I achieve is no bad data is exposed to production in case something failed. And even if it didn't fail and, some, and somehow I missed something and I got some sort of corruption of data in production, I can roll back here. 
I know exactly where to roll back for that specific execution of the transformation. Right? That's the first example. The second example that we're going to go through is an example where I say, you know what, I want to do more than that. Within the DAG, I'm going to create commits. I'm going to create branches. So when I need to troubleshoot that, right, that red step, I can go to that specific commit identifier and troubleshoot that. So let's look at that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So everything that I'm showing you right now is not only available in our open source solution, but also just to show you what this looks like, we have a Git repository for LakeFS samples. Um, so happy that what's broken is Git and not LakeFS, and that's taking a long time. <laughs> it's going to take time until Git will be LakeFS for code. Uh, so nobody gets my humor. <laughs> Thank you. My wife tells me that at least I make myself laugh, so that's a good start. Um, I have here a bunch of, um, of, of, of examples. There's some standalone examples here, specifically Airflow 01, you're gonna see over here. So if someone wants to run this, you, literally all you need to do is clone this and then build a single Docker Compose file, and this will have a Jupyter notebook on it with everything that you need and all the prerequisites to run, I mean, literally that's what I'm running right now. Like I'm gonna run the Jupyter Notebook from here uh, that, I, that I spun up before that has this, these examples. And the existing DAG and the new DAG. Right now, because of timing, I'm not gonna actually execute them. I executed them um, before, it's hard to read a little bit, before, before the meeting, but uh, I'll show you what this looks like. So what I did here is I basically created a repository called Airflow Summit Existing DAG Repo2, very catchy name. Uh, and what I did is I took an existing DAG and I, I, I wrapped it with, with what we saw before. So this is my existing DAG. This is, by the way, the Airflow ETL um, example. If you guys are familiar, I, I forgot what it does. Also doesn't matter uh, in this case. What I do is I creating a branch, running the DAG, committing, and then merging. Now, when I commit this, I can go to, I can click on this commit, and this will give me a point to go back into LakeFS. So I can click on it, and this will take me to LakeFS, and I can see here in LakeFS the actual data set at the time of that commit. So what file was added, if there are more files, I can browse the entire data sets, there's not, because this is a single file ETL. But I can get the data in context as it, as it went within the DAG. And this is a bi-directional thing, right? So I can also go from any individual uh, repo. Ooh, there's a lot here. Let's go to Airflow Summit, new DAG. And I can go to any branch or any commit or any file Right, let's say I see as any specific file. You, you guys remember the, the blame functionality from before? So when I go and I do the blame functionality now, because this file was created by an Airflow DAG, I, it's a bi-directional integration. I can also open the Airflow UI. And this will take me to the UI of that DAG, right? So if I'm troubleshooting an issue with my data because I don't know what happened, I can go and see exactly where it, when and where it was created in which version of which DAG at which task. It's pretty awesome, I think. And more than that, if we look at this example before, and this is the new DAG example, look how quickly we moved to that. Here I have a DAG that I wrote, and I added like these, uh, these different commits as we go, these different branches. So the different branches will be used a lot of times um, you have multiple data sets that, are, uh, that don't necessarily need to be, uh, that you can work on them synchronously, right? So you'll have multiple branches with multiple DAGs that will work with multiple branches, multiple transformations and different data sets. And you can do that in parallel and commit those and then merge all of them. Another use case for that is some of them you might be okay if you're missing some data, but some of them you might wanna fail the ATL if you're missing some data. So this gives you also that type of flexibility as you work on this. But the idea is that also when something fails, once again, 
I can go to the commit, I can look at LegFS, and I can see the, the commit that actually failed here before. So this is pretty cool. Uh, in this example specifically, this is the, um, the new DAG example, and you can see it. What it actually does is it executes a DAG twice and tries to repartition the data, and one time a column is missing and it fails because the column is missing, and you can go to this code from start to finish uh, should you want to, to do that and, and also look at, look at it here as well. Um, so, a few, a few last notes after looking at that demo, and then I'll open for questions. Uh, yeah, so the idea is that you are a lot, you save on storage, you're a lot more productive. Uh, we have uh, a, a customer called Enigma Technologies that said they reduced their testing time by 80%. That's a lot. Uh, that's in their blog, not in mine. I should add the link here actually, because it's better than whatever I'll tell you. Uh, so <laughs> that's uh, pretty awesome. And of course, the recovery is immediate. So if something happened to production, you can always roll back. LakeFS is open source. Everything I showed you today is open source. You have not seen a single feature that is not open source. It's an open core approach, meaning that we're happy to try it. Of course, we have a SaaS offering, we have an enterprise offering, and if anybody's interested, happy to talk about that. Um, but I think more importantly, we have a really big community, uh, over a thousand uh, companies, every thousand installations that we are aware of. I'm sure there's more. Uh, you guys are all familiar with the open source uh, idea. Um, and you're more than welcome to join our Slack and take part of it. There's a help channel that we monitor and we help at, you know, within reason, of course. Uh, and we'd love to have you guys uh, take part. And the last thing is, uh, this is Loti, the Axelotl. And these are all I have left and you're more than welcome to take any of those back home with you. It's a magical creature that keeps the lake clean, just like us, okay? So, uh, any questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah, we have, we have some time. Okay. Uh, first, that looks like a great technology, um, but I have a question. Can you rebase Lacking it? So the use case for me is that I develop a DAC, something changes in the data between, and I don't want to like, have the, the old version of data. Yes, the, the, the question, oh, actually, you have a microphone. Everybody heard a question. Yes, you can rebase using LakeFS. Uh, there is no single rebase uh, command, but it's super easy to do. It's three commands instead of one, just to be fair. And we have customers doing that, uh, and that's used for exactly reprocess. Like the, the use case is reprocessing data because you found out that something happened before. Hello. Uh, so how does LakeFS fit in with something like Apache Iceberg? Because uh, we recently, well, about a few months ago, started using Iceberg, and it, Iceberg has a lot of similar kind of ideas like branching and, and snapshot IDs. That is a fantastic question. I think that's one of my favorite questions. I didn't have it in my slide, but I have a slide about it. Uh, so first of all, we are format agnostic. We zero compete with any open table format, like Delta, like Iceberg, like Hoodie. As a matter of fact, we are partners with Databricks. We have like shared webinars of Databricks and LakeFS, Delta Lakes specifically in LakeFS better together. We have multiple users and Iceberg, multiple users and uh, Delta, just like to put that out of the way. Not competing, different use cases. First, LakeFS is format agnostic, meaning that it's not only for tabular data, right? So that's kind of the obvious thing. Like if you wanna do this, like one of the major use cases for LakeFS is a machine learning reproducibility use case that works with images and annotations and videos and things like that. And obviously you can't version control that. The second differences are again in the use cases. One, an open table format gives you the ability to go back in time in a table, right? Not in a repository. If you think of it in a Git, I don't wanna see, the, I mean, it's, it's useful to see the file that changed, but the use case that I'm talking about is a, is a pull request, is go back to the last release. Right, so I want to undo this DAG. That's right. and, and I don't want to know which tables to, I, I, I don't want to look and see what are the 15 tables that are a part of it, and then go to a time, time step for those 15 tables only, and see if there's any other tables that actually read from those tables at that time. Right, I want to go to a release. So that's one. The second one is in the isolation. So uh, specifically, Iceberg has branches also, but those are read-only short-leave branches. Those are not read-write branches, right? So if you think of the use case 
for example, the airflow use case or a testing use case or a CICD use case, you need an isolation of a branch that's long living that you can write to and modify. And the third difference in the use case is in the, in the hooks, like the, the Git actions. We have a pre-merge, post-branch, pre-commit, right, hooks. And those are also a lot of times used to actually execute DAGs, right? So imagine that you write to a dirty ingest branch and then you promote the data and you want to ch check automatically that the, um, form, that the table schema didn't change. Or you're going to run an ETL and you want to make sure that you actually promote, produce the number of um, rows that you want to produce. We have time for a quick question, if there's any left. Okay. The answer is yes. <laughs> and that wraps it up. I'm, I'm joking. Extending the last question, so how does it differ from the Apache Nessie project? From? Apache Nessie. Oh, that's a great question. Nessie is an open source project by Dreamio uh, that is in the market, sounds the most like LifeFS. The main differences from Nessie is that Nessie works only on Iceberg, right? And there's other uh, big differences that I'll, I'll let you look at them in terms of like number of stars, number of users, like that, that adoption is tremendously different between Nessie and uh, LifeFS. And I think it's because Nessie is only for Iceberg. That's my guess. Okay, that wraps it up. Thanks a lot, Ido. Thank you. Help yourself for uh, plushies. <laughs> <laughs>